Archie Trundle. Uh, Mr. Trundle, Trundle is a World War II veteran and has kindly agreed to come in and tell his story in connection with the Veterans History Project. We're also honored to have Mrs. Joyce Trundle, Mr. Trundle's wife of 64 years, and uh, we really appreciate both of y'all coming in today. Mr. Trundle, could you give me your full name and your date of birth? Archie Franklin Trundle. January the 3rd, 1924. And what is your current address? 3201 Hope Street, Hapeville, Georgia, 30354. Okay. Mr. Trundle, tell us a little bit about uh, your upbringing and your family. Well, uh, I guess I was raised during the Depression. My mother and father separated when I was real young. And I was, I guess, dumped on my grandparents and uh, that was in a little community south of Ringgold, Georgia, uh, about seven miles, and I was raised with them on the farm there till I got a little older, and then my father married, and so had my mother, and she was in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, my father was in Chattanooga, Tennessee, so I lived with them, and uh, uh, things wasn't pleasant for me at home on either place. I always felt like I wasn't welcome. So when I got to be 17, I went into the Marine Corps recruiting station and told him I'd like to sign up. And he said, well, how old are you, son? I said, I'm 17. He said, well, uh, you got to be 18 to get in the Marine Corps. Come back tomorrow and don't forget how old you are. <laughs> so I was back there the next day. I was 18 and they signed me up. <laughs> you aged in that one day, right? <laughs> I, I got a year older in one day. How did your family feel about that when you told them you had a they, they They didn't have a decision. That was my decision to make. I, I just... Uh, I told him, went back and told my father I'd signed up to go in the Marine Corps and I had to go to Nashville, Tennessee to all the examination and everything. And when I came back through and uh, trained, my, he met me and wished me well and I was off to Paris Island. Wow. And this was May of 1941? Yes. Right. Okay. May the 23rd. Okay. Tell us about uh, your training at Paris Island and, what, and just throughout your training, look your experiences. Well, the training was much different today uh, then than it is today in that when the uh, drill instructor met us over there he made a speech like you've never heard before in your life about how sorry we was and so on and so forth and uh, so when he said get on that truck it's a big truck we about tore the back end out of that truck getting on it so uh, we drilled till midnight that night, and uh, then the next day is routine to get in clothing and uh, uh, getting accustomed to what the procedures was and what they expected of us and what they put into us. And uh, it and whoever is a marine, if he goes through training, it instills something in you that lasts a lifetime. That's me or whoever that boot training. And the thing that's different about Marine, every Marine is a rifleman, regardless of what his specialty might be. So if they got into a combat situation, why, well, he could be pulled out of anything and be part of the unit. How long were you, were you down there? In Paris Island? Yeah. Uh, I was down there uh, two months in training. Then when I finished, they did send everybody someplace. They asked us all where we'd like to go, and I didn't say any place to me. But I was in the boat crew at Paris Island. They had boats then, and I think, guess the Navy had charge of it. They had a tug there, and this tug was used to uh, two ways. It went up to Port Royal and got coal because the uh, electric power was generated right there um, off the water where we brought this tug back to, uh, huh. and then we had a couple of officers gigs and several motor launches, and one of the motor launches would go out behind the uh, 
rifle range when they were firing and when they'd pull that target up why we knew to keep the uh, people out there they'd come in there fishing so uh, that was part of our duty okay. then we went to that had Marines over at Hilton Head that's before they ever had a bridge over there so it's our duty to take them over there we'd have to take food over there to them if they got sick we had to go get them and bring them back and it's a pretty long trip over there uh, to the dock where they yeah. we took them and uh, then our job would be tow targets out there for training and uh, so that was that this was before Pearl Harbor oh so yes did what was the general feeling among your your comrades and, and, and your feeling about whether there was going to be a war or not? Well, uh, I, as the Sunday afternoon, I was there just walking around on the base one day, said, and I guess we didn't really realize what it was getting us into at the time. But we sure learned that uh, uh, the training and all had picked up and uh, I'd stayed in the boat crew, I guess, there a year and a half, and I put in for uh, a transfer to Amphibian Tractors, which was at Dunedin, Florida. So I was kind of in on the beginning of the Amphibian Tractors, and there was a lot of changes in them from the beginning to what it is to present day time. What, what kind of changes? Well, the uh, original ones had a smaller engine in them, they were aluminum, and that was one of the problems they had. And when we, uh, they had them over there with the coral reefs over there, the coral reefs just tore the bottom out of them and they sank, you know. Huh. But they wasn't, they was, people don't realize that all of the islands over there had coral reefs around them. So the small boats couldn't cut in. So the tractors was the thing that was hauling them in. Well, at Peladu and everything, these tractors we had originally, they tore the bottom out of them, and uh, they was, uh, we were forming the 4th Marine Division at the time, which was in uh, Camp Pendleton, California. I was in a boat basin there. And uh, every division of the Marines had a tractor battalion. So it's the 1st tractor battalion, 2nd, 3rd, and we was the 4th amphibian tractor battalion. Well, when all of this happened, they saw the need, so they divided us in half and made the 10th Tractor Pan Battalion and the 4th, which went to the Marshall Islands together. Well, after the invasion there, they split us out and we went down to uh, Guadalcanal, where they had the 1st Marine Brigade, and uh, we went to Guam with the 1st Marine G Brigade. They later added another regiment to it and made the 6th Marine Division, which went to Okinawa. And uh, when did that, you, excuse me. No, you go ahead. that was the first Marine Division that was ever uh, formed overseas. Oh, okay. What was your feeling when you found out you were actually going overseas? I mean, you were, I guess, Pendleton. Well, and, I don't know. I just, I just knew that I had a job to do. And... Uh, we uh, had to go to San Diego. They had all the equipment there. We had to do a lot of service on it before we could load it aboard. Most of the traveling I ever did was aboard an LST. And of course, that was the way they had to get the tractors up on them and haul them around. So, now what, what did you understand your job was going to be when you headed overseas? Well, I was uh, in charge of maintenance. And my job was to teach the fellows how to uh, do some maintenance work on them and how to uh, keep them up, how to drive them. And uh, it, it was a, wasn't a specialty thing to teach them how to drive, but to teach them how to get in trouble, keep out of trouble, was a big problem. Yeah. What I'd like you to do now is just start talking about your experiences from the time you left the United States and throughout the Pacific places you went well, and what you saw uh, and what you felt. We uh, hit two storms going out and it ain't funny on an LST hitting a storm. I mean they're just sliding all over and one of our good friends had a appendicitis attack and he died on the way over 
and I've thought about that a lot. Uh, great, great kid, and uh, so uh, that was one. Then when we got to uh, uh, Hawaii, we were at uh, a little island there, uh, which we went back to later, uh, and we just got off and back on for a short time. And uh, overnight, and then we got back on and went for the invasion of the Marshall Islands. Talk about that. The well, Marshall Islands. that wasn't too bad. It was small islands, and uh, the uh, as far as our part was very minimal there. So after they was secured there in a few days, why we loaded back up and headed to uh, uh, Guadalcanal. We didn't know where we was going. We got there, we had to cut our way in the jungle and and fix a place for us to put our tents up and stay. So it was quite an experience. Well, I know Guadalcanal was one of the more, most significant battles of World War II. Would you yeah. tell us about that, and what the conditions were and what you faced? Well, and, the uh, conditions there were bad in that the mosquitoes and, uh, you know, going in there as an invasion uh, it was uh, real bad because you, you had no place to stay and uh, sleeping on the ground. It rained a lot, so uh, it, it wasn't a com comfortable situation at all. Would you describe any the contacts you had with the Japanese, the the, the battles? Of the well, the that uh, the most that we had with them was when we went to Guam. Okay. And uh, the uh, uh, tractors, of course, was the main thing to get the troops in. Yeah. And they had, we had two brothers in our outfit, and their name was Mays, Ray and Johnny Mays. Well, the tractor that Johnny, he was the older of the two. When we were going in, we'd go in in waves. And uh, the wave I was going into was, say, Red One, and I had. Uh, a chaplain on my tractor. Marines don't have uh, anything for it, but sailors, uh, Navy people, for chaplains and also for, they're attached to us for medicine. So uh, going in, this chaplain said he didn't want to go to Red 1, he wanted to go to Red 2. I said, well, I'll put you on a tractor that's going in there. It happened to be Johnny May's tractor. Well, when they got in there, right on Guam, and we've since been back and seen that, his tractor was right in there, and it killed everybody on that tractor, including Johnny. And his brother stayed on the beach there and cried for three days, and they sent him home. But uh, I just thought, I've thought about that a lot. Here's this chaplain with me, and he wants on this other tractor, and he goes in there and gets yeah. killed. So, you know, those things. and. Then uh, we played a real important part during the war of hauling out wounded and uh, so on that the small boats couldn't get in over those coral reefs. And people probably didn't realize that those islands have coral reefs around them. Would you describe that, just the, the experience of these wounded young men coming on your, your craft and taking them out? Well, it's a, uh, we, uh, what they do is uh, once we haul everybody in, everybody turns to left and comes back out so that the wave behind don't get clogged up with you. You go down and come out in the same place. Then they, as soon as they can, they set up signs there that tell you that uh, this is for water, this is for ammunition, this is for uh, food or what have you. Then when you get a load, you don't have to run up and down the beach. You know right where to go with the load you've got. Then by then, while you're having to carry out wounded, so you get wounded after you've carried in a load, you take them back out to the hospital ship uh, if they can't accommodate them there on the beach. Uh, they usually have a tent set up so they, the wounded, they can look after them. The corpsmen, uh, we treat them with kid gloves because of their importance to us. When you were landed at Guadalcanal and at Guam, were you taking fire? 
Pardon? Were you taking fire? Were you with, was oh, yeah. Gap -based constant artillery fire. Or? Constant fire. I, I hooked up to a tank that was in a shell hole out in the coral reef and uh, was going to try to pull him out. Well, the water was up just enough that I'd bounce when I'd try to pull. Well, the Japs had uh, uh, guns in the peninsula there it's up high. It's uh, not level with uh, like the rest of it. And they were firing at us. They had us, they rode in. And why they never hit us, I'll never know. But they must have fired uh, 15 to 20 rounds. They'd go over one side, one the other. And usually when they zero you in, then you're going to get one. Well, I just looked back in the back, waiting for it to come in. Now, were you on Guadalcanal until we took the island? Pardon? Were you on Guadalcanal until we took the island? Were you there for the entire battle? No, I wasn't in the battle of Guadalcanal. But that was just a rest area for us after okay. we went by the Marshall Island. Oh, okay. Now. Talk about Guam a little bit more. What what did you do in Guam? Well, the uh, Guam, of course, was uh, real essential. The 1st Marine Brigade and also the 3rd Marine Division, we both went on either side of this peninsula, went out. And uh, later, the 77th Army came in there. But they waited in there. They didn't have any facilities to bring them in, so they waited in. And uh, it was just a constant thing for us. The bad part of it was me. I got dengue fever and uh, diarrhea. They had to put me in the hospital there, along with a lot of others. And uh, so it's uh, the thing, thing I've always thought about. The big old flies, you couldn't shake them off. You had to push them off of what you was eating. So, you know, they was on dead bodies and coming back to your food. And it's pretty evident what you're going to get some of it. Well, the conditions on those islands must have been horrible with the insects and the weather. And the... Yeah, well, uh, one thing I told her when we went back over there after uh, 50 years, we went back for a celebration for her. And uh, the uh, thing that was uh, odd, it rained every afternoon. I told her that. And when we got there, I said, what we'd do, we knew that rain was coming, we'd just strip off and start Washing down, yeah. <laughs> and they showed that on television here, I think, uh, recently. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, But that was the way it was it's every afternoon. You could just depend on a hard rain. Wouldn't last long enough to wash <laughs> off. And so, when I'll get into when we went back uh, 50 years. Uh, there's about 1,200 of us, and uh, they had saved up the money to entertain us. So uh, they did royally. We were there a week and they had uh, big feeds for us and uh, entertainment and uh, the, uh, I took her to the beach that we landed on and that big concrete st pillbox was still there. So she got to see that and uh, uh, it was... Uh, Just to be sure we're clear, is that Guam you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Go, go ahead, I want to hear yeah. more. Yeah, this on, on Guam. Okay. And uh, so, uh, but they did treat us royally, yeah. and uh, they'd saved enough money to do all of this. So after we got home, we got a check from the governor of Guam for $300 and thanking us for our service God. over there. So it was uh, quite had, an experience. That had to make you feel good, didn't it? Yeah, it sure did. And, uh, but the thing that was, that most people don't know, and I'll bring this in, they would come up and hug us, even the young people, their parents had told us, but the Japanese treated them terrible. If the women wouldn't have sex with them, they'd cut their heads off, they'd have men digging a hole, and when they got it dug, they'd shoot them and shove them into the hole. So the, we was fighting a different war yeah. than they were fighting in the European theater. It was kill or be killed. They wouldn't yeah. surrender, so... Yeah. Uh, it's a different type of enemy, wasn't it? Yes, it sure was. They were, were... Were there people that, when you went back to Guam, it sounds like there were some of the local people who had been there when the Japanese oh, were Oh, yes, there. they were. So that's, they, that's the reason they appreciated their, yeah. what we'd done, because that was the only American possession that the Japanese took, yeah. and uh, they knew the liberation of it. 
and they got something there that's I, I don't guess any other out. That's the first time I saw dogs, the Marines with dogs to okay. sniff them out. Oh, okay. And they got a beautiful little cemetery for the dogs there. Really? It's it's real elaborate and nice. That's interesting. I don't think I've ever heard that. That's she got to see it. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. Got pictures of it. Oh, that's wonderful. Cemetery for war dogs. Golly. So it was a uh, it was a real experience and. Uh, the uh, another thing we was board the carrier, which is an, an attack carrier, which was the Bella Woods, and the attack carrier is different. The rest they carry helicopters and a complement of Marines aboard, and uh, they uh, are out there. For instance, they can go right in with uh, and the deck, lower deck on that is like an LSD. They can drop that deck down and flood it, so a boat or amphibian tractors can go right in there and raise it up and get the water out of it. And then we went to Pensacola a few years ago when they had the christening of the Iwo Jima, which was an attack carrier, the same as the one that the Bell Wood. So it was quite interesting. But on that little side effect, when we was bored there, why? Well, here they come up through there with uh, beer on the thing, board ship. I told her, that's just a no-no. <laughs> then it was docked and everything and celebrated. <laughs> and I said, here comes a bunch of Marines. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was like a magnet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, going back to your service now, after Guam, did, where did you go? We went back to, well, we went. I mean, back with you, back in the 1940s. Yeah, we, we went back to the. Uh, Guadalcanal okay. after there okay. and started getting prepared to go to Okinawa. Okay. Talk about your experiences from that point Well, they, of course, every time you are going to get into something, they never let you know till you're on the way where you're going. But uh, they have you go through training, you get the troops and simulated beaches and so on. It's, it's kind of like a football player or anybody in sports. You keep doing these things till you know what your part is, even though you're scared, why well, you'll do what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And so that's what we did, and then loaded aboard the ship and uh, went uh, on our way to Okinawa. Would you tell us about your experiences in Okinawa? Yeah, it uh, was real unusual. We landed, uh, there was nothing on the beach we landed on. What had happened? Only we were uh, guests about the mid to north end of the island, which is quite long. They had two marine divisions simulate on the opposite side of the island, on the other end of it, way down, that they were going to land down there. Okay. So when they got out and started landing, why well, they put down a smoke screen and pulled out. And consequently, when we landed up there with the 6th Division, there was nothing up there, no resistance, huh. Huh. practically none. But one thing that they ought to know, that we always landed where there was an airstrip. Okay. And that's what we did there, the airstrip. In fact, about the second day, a plane come in there. On our way up, we saw several of them go in the drain that had, really? and that was the purpose of getting there, and the same with Iwo Jima. Uh, a landing strip for these planes that have been hit and got troubles to, to land. But and another thing was kind of funny that was the young, real young fellows that was piloting those planes, one of them says, I'll take any bet that this war will be over in 30 days. <laughs> they knew something that yeah. was supposed yeah. to be top secret. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but it was, it was really bad and uh, the, uh, we went north, and there was little resistance up in that area. And then the army had come in down there, and we relieved the army. And that, that that was kind of touchy situation. But talk about that. Would you? Well, it was just uh, they'd met a lot of resistance, and then, of course the commander there had been killed, Bolivar, and uh, had a marine replace them, which had never happened before. So. Uh, so the Marine was commanding the Army troops? Yes. Okay. yes. After he lost his life. Right. And uh, 
So it was a tough battle. There was a lot of civilians there that, and this had happened at Saipan too. Uh, we were floating reserve for Saipan for 30 days because they had met so much resistance there that we were supposed to hit Guam the next day. But they had met so much resistance and about run them off the island that they kept us in reserve floating out there. So we had to go back to Kwajalein and draw on food and supplies because LST can't make its own water and food. So they had to go back there before we could go and invade Guam. But the Japanese had told the people there what terrible things we'd do to them if we caught them. So they had a big cliff there that women with babies in their arms were jumping off and into the rocks way down below and uh, all the civilians were just jumping off. And the same thing had happened at Okinawa. And I got a picture of, I set off and got the tape of uh, the real battle there. And uh, to show you the mentality of the Japanese, there was a young lady that they wanted them her to go with them, and she didn't want to go, so they cut one of her feet off. It actually shows that. So the thing I wonder in my mind today, if the mentality of the Japanese is still like it was then, or if it's in the younger people. When you went back, did you have any exposure to any Japanese oh, people yeah. at all? I yeah, mean, when yeah. you went back, this your more recent trip. Oh no, uh, they they. Uh, there wasn't any, uh, there'd be very few. In fact, uh, like on Guam there, there'd be two or three there that was there for years longer. They'd come down and get food out of the garbage cans and what have you, and yeah. stay hid in the bushes or what have yeah. you. And, uh, yeah. But uh, then they finally give up. And uh, But they were all told that it was gonna be uh, uh, real bad what we'd do to them and all, so, yeah. and then they conveyed this to the civilians, but uh, there was a lot of civilians there. That's the first time we'd experienced anything like that. So so you came in, did you come in contact with some of the civilians oh, in yeah. Okinawa? Yeah. Hmm. They, uh, very uh, cow type of person, you know, after what they'd been told and yeah. with us, they didn't know what would happen to them, so. It was quite an experience for them. Did you have enough exposure to the civilians to, to see how they reacted once they realized you weren't going to brutalize them like the well, Japanese? Well, there was not a lot of emotion, like you know, for us, it like we get excited about something. Yeah. Like, uh, they they were very <coughs> cowed and they were not sure that you know after yeah. all had been the gun, because we had a lot of the fighting ones was right in there among them and we yeah. killed them and, yeah. uh, they wasn't going to give up so right. tell them about the mud tell them. what the mud on Okinawa oh yeah it uh, rained like you've never seen it rain for two weeks there and uh, the amphibian tractors was the only thing that would move in all that mud it's like the mud here in Georgia if you keep going in it, it just gets to be a slush. Yeah. So we were hauling up ammunition and things to the front lines and uh, hauling out the wounded. And at, at the end there, I know there was kids uh, 14, 15 years old coming in there. I guess they'd got just taking anything they could get. Yeah, sure. And uh, they'd go up, haul them out in that afternoon. There was, there was a lot of people killed on uh, Okinawa. It was uh, so. So once the landing force was ashore, your the the, the amphibious tractor battalions actually moved up and provided support to the ground forces as yeah, they moved yeah, along the island. Yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, so you were right in the middle of the combat. Pardon? You were right in the middle of combat. Oh, yeah, on that. Yes. That, they they knew what we was doing, and when they'd see us coming in, and they'd they'd look for us and fire. We'd go through as fast as we could in an area where they knew they'd be shooting at us. But it's, um, it was quite an experience. It's something that gets in your mind, they can't get it out. And all the ships, all the ships out in the water. The ships that were out there 
Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. there, I've never seen as many ships in my life as it was there. As far as you could see was ship. And then of course, the thing too that was uh, bad was these kamikaze planes. They would come in, they'd come in a high altitude and peel off and the sky would just be red with tracer ammunition and they'd just keep coming. It seldom they'd hit one of them and knock them out. The Navy took a beating there. Uh, could you see that from the eye? Oh yeah, you could see that. Yeah. Because it, the ship was all right in there. It's, uh, of course, they was constantly firing the battle wags and cruisers, firing shells in there. And I told her, I said, you could hear three. When it went overhead, it'd make an awful noise. Then you'd hear it out here. Then you'd hear it when it landed. <laughs> So it was uh, quite an experience, and uh, I guess that's about all I can think of. Well, did you lose many men in your unit? Uh, not there. We lost more at Guam than we oh, did there. Okay. It's, uh, I guess it's according to, you know, where you hit and yeah. uh, how they're set up for you and all. Yeah. Would you... When you were up on the front lines and you were taking fire and you you, you saw the, the carnage, did you feel fear? Oh yeah, you're scared to death. I, uh, the first landing was Marshall Island. Well, our breakfast was always steak and eggs for the landing. That was the only one I was able to eat. The next time I was, I was lucky to hold a cup of coffee and drink it. It's, uh, I was scared, yeah. and I guess if you wasn't scared, you wasn't human. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, when when uh, when you would form the when when you would come off the LST, yeah, before they gave the signal to form the wave and land, how long were you in the water uh, before you got the? Uh, oh, you! It was almost instantaneous. Okay. You, as soon as you got off, you formed your line and. Uh, went right in, uh, the small boats would take you in so far and then we was on our own we knew where it was going because it's lined up down there going to red one, red two, yellow one and so on. Did did you know where the coral reefs were when you were making Not, the run Not, you couldn't tell till you hit it. Okay. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's usually uh, not enough to float you, you'd hit, you know, going in and uh, and we'd have uh, 25 to 30 Marines in the tractor going in. They, that was something too. The original tractors didn't have a tailgate on them, so they had to go over the side. So later on we got this tailgate on them and dropped that tailgate and they could come out and go both sides and a lot more secure yeah, for them. Yeah. That, that way than uh, having to go over the side. I don't know if you really had a chance to observe because you were you had your own mission, but did you have much of a chance to observe the Marines that were in your vehicle as you were approaching the beach? No, we weren't looking at no. <laughs> We were looking ahead and uh, of course he, it, uh, they had machine guns mounted up on the front of them, so okay. we was the ones is outside with the crew, yeah. literally three men on a tractor to drop the thing and get it back up and okay. machine guns when you're going in and so that was, uh, didn't have much to observe them. Yeah. Before we move on to your next stop, is there anything else you want to tell us about your experiences on either Guadalcanal, Guam, or uh, Okinawa? Um, yeah. I'm Trying to think you of, didn't mention how they would hide in the caves and oh yeah the uh, and the, most all of the islands they were in caves they're like rats in there so they'd uh, get the flamethrowers and put it in there and that that give them get them going pretty good <laughs> but uh, it that, that was the same on Iwo and uh, there and. Uh, it's uh, you just knew what you had to do and had to get them out, and uh, so it was uh, it wasn't a pleasant task at all, yeah. and 
I had bad nightmares when I got home, mm -hmm. and I still have one occasionally. Really? And uh, so I guess it's something that's, uh, we react differently, all of us are, we're all different, so we act yeah. different to different yeah. things. When, when you had, when the invasion of Guam, when the island, when Guam was secured and you came back to Guadalcanal, uh, how long were you there and what was life like? I mean, I know you talked about the rain, but what was... Well, uh, you, you go through training. We have some time. I enjoyed playing uh, ball. We had softball teams and had a movie every night and uh, had logs there for us to sit on. It's an outdoor movie, and it poured down rain. Nobody had bad an eye just sat there. <laughs> uh, well, how long were you there before you got before you loaded up and moved out again? Well, let me see. I'd say probably a couple of months. Okay. And uh, then we on the way up, we went by uh, Ulithia, and that was kind of a station for the navy there. And we saw uh, a couple of battle wagons and. A carrier that had been hit and uh, in bad shape, but, but I say it's uh, unbelievable. A uh, battle, everybody took a beat in the Navy, the whole bit. Yeah. And, uh, it's, uh, it's been quite an experience. When you left Okinawa, was the battle over or was it no, still going? We went back to Guam from there, and rather uh, went back to Guam and we'd drawn new equipment to go to Japan. When we heard about the atomic bomb, we knew that that had been dropped. But when we was there, we'd already drawn equipment to go to Japan. So they would, would have been six Marine divisions, which had been close to 200,000 Marines. And, uh, and you would have been part of the invasion of Japan? Pardon? You would have been part of the invasion yeah, of Japan? I wouldn't be sitting here looking at you yeah, today. Yeah. I'd like you to tell us about the reaction, your reaction and the reaction of your your comrades when you heard that the bomb had been dropped? Well, I was laying in my bunk. It happened in the evening and uh, I, I just couldn't hardly believe that it was over with. And uh, that wasn't no celebration on my part, but I was just thankful that the thing had come to an end. It's, uh, I could hear a few of them hollering a little bit, but uh, there was no big celebration because <laughs> it could have been a false alarm, you yeah, know. Yeah. So it's a, it was quite a shock. Would you tell us what happened so from that point forward in, in your career? You, you were still yeah, in the Pacific well, uh, and the war was over? And... We got to go home according to a number thing that they had. Of course, I'd been over there so long and been in three invasions, so I was top of the heap. But I still, I was a regular Marine. I extended my enlistment through my first sergeant before we went to Okinawa. Well, the war was over when my enlistment was out, but I had two more years to do. So when we went back, uh, uh, they met us at uh, Salvation Army was always been my choice because they met us there with fresh milk and uh, the food is a big thing. and. Uh, you know, when you're in combat, you just eat out of a little box or something, and they've really got them up to date now with what they got. But back then, we had K rations, and they wasn't nothing you'd want to take home to mom. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but, uh, it was, uh, as I say, when I got there, they were passing out the milk. And by there, where is that? That's at San Diego. San Diego. The ship goes up and around to stay in the flow of the thing. And it took us about 30 days to come back to there. And so I had to go through a separation center different from the rest of them because I was a regular Marine. And uh, they said, well, we can't give you the east or the west coast, can't give you the base. Said, what would you like to go? I said, any place on the East Coast would be fine. He said, Boat Basin, which is right up the road there at Pound Pendleton. And I often thought I should have argued with him and tell him I hadn't been home over two and a half years. I said, looks like you could give me there. And they had tractors there. 
And I, when I got up there and stayed at Pendleton for a while, where a captain come through there as a friend of mine, I said, take me to the East Coast with you. He did. So I went to the East Coast. They have uh, tractors at uh, Camp Lejeune there oh, yeah. also. And they've, uh, we've had a reunion of our outfit every year since the war. That's wonderful. And we've, uh, one of them we had was in Florida which was a fourth assault amphibian tractor battalion, and she and I worked together and got a nice plaque to hang up down there of all the Marines that had ever been in a battle with the fourth Marine Division. Good God. The fourth the amphibian, amphibian tractor, tractor battalion. Gee, and they've got it hung down there. They also had our battle flight there. We were the fourth Marine Division. They were the fourth assault amphibian tractor battalion. So. They treated us royally there. They had a, at the time they had a, a Marine birthday party when we was there, and we got front seats there. And one of our guys was the oldest guy, so he cut the cake, and uh, so it was quite an experience. And but we've been all over the country. Whoever holds it is, uh, you know, the champion. And this year it's going to be in Arizona. Wow. And it's got down now, but when they won't be but about eight Marines out of the original bunch that'll be there. Well, that's wonderful that you continue to have the reunions, though. That's, yeah. uh, did Did you realize when you were serving that you were part of probably one of the most significant events in world history, and certainly our history of this no, country? No, <laughs> that wasn't one of my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, uh, I guess everyone's thought is trying to stay alive. Yeah. It's, uh, you see so many killed. I know on Guam that first night there, they had Marines piled up in a pile just through them because they hadn't got enough to start a cemetery there. So had to do something with them and they just pile them up there. And I, I think about that a lot. Sure you, do. you know, there's things that happen that you don't talk about, and uh, you know, it's not interesting to anybody to me go up and start telling them about having Marines piled up. But I think about it a lot. The young men that made a sacrifice for this country, and yet there don't seem to be much appreciation for what was done. Well, this is why it's so important for you to be telling your story to anybody you can tell it to, because yeah. people need to know that. And, and I'm so glad you're doing this today. You, you did you ever get any good liberty? Pardon? Did you ever get any good liberty? I no. mean, you were you were in Guadalcanal and Guam, and I mean, you never hit Australia. No, or... no it was no place to go to liberty. The only the only ones that had any decent liberty was the First Marine Division when they went back to uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, New Zealand. Okay. And uh, other than that, why they had. Uh, the ladies on the island there were black, and uh, they just wore a little skirt, nothing on the top. Yeah. And uh, the uh, first one I'd ever seen that had their hair dyed uh, uh, yellow or a uh, color other really? than really? black. But uh, they didn't speak any English, and uh, we didn't have much in common. So there wasn't a lot of no. interaction. Just you just see them occasionally, and. So you spent two and a half years in the boondocks. Yeah, it's over there. And uh, <coughs> in fact, uh, I met her, and first time I ever saw her, I pointed my finger at her and said, "When I come back, we're going to get married." And her remark was, "Well, you don't even know me." So our correspondence, we didn't. I was with her a couple of times. We never had any real dates. But then I didn't see her for two and a half years, and it's all letter writing, so it must have been effective. <laughs> you must have been a good letter writer. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> well, well, talk about that. When you, when did you get married, and how long have you been well, married? Well, uh, when I came back from overseas, I had 30 days. Well, I was going to spend two weeks riding a train back and forth. Back then, that's the only way to go. Yeah. So. Uh, she met me, and she and my dad met me at uh, 
depot in Chattanooga there and I hugged her and kissed her and I said, when are we going to get married? She said, well, we need to get acquainted first. <laughs> so we're still trying to get acquainted after 64 years. <laughs> I think well, it's going to work. We waited three weeks. Three and weeks. It happened to be Christmas Eve. Oh. But I've always felt like God was good to me that he brought me back and gave me a wonderful family and we're proud of all of them and uh, it's uh, something most people don't have the yeah. pleasure of having. Yeah. And uh, I'm indeed thankful. And I've often said that's the best investment I ever made. I give two dollars for and wouldn't take a million for it. <laughs> <laughs> but we've we've get along great and I love her as much today as I ever did. So uh, that's I oh, think that counts for me. While we're getting the picture, what was the mood of the country when you got back? The war had just been won? And well, I don't know. I didn't get much mood of the country because uh, just my family, mostly, that was uh, around. Yeah. And, but I guess it was, uh, she saw the celebrations more after Europe and uh, Japan yeah. because it was uh, over a month before I got home. Yeah. Well, how much how much information there toward the end of the war? I mean, there was VE Day and then the bomb. Were you aware? Did did you have much information coming in on what was happening in the world in terms of you know the wind down of the war? Not really. Uh, uh, we just knew it's over, and then we was wondering when we was going to get to come home. You know, so uh, the. Uh, did, did you have any news about what was going on in Europe when you were over there? No, nothing other than it. The, the VJ day, yeah. we knew about that. Yeah. But uh, I'm going to show this up. There. Yeah, we're going to have you describe what this picture is. <laughs> so you really didn't get any type of reports of us landing at Normandy or no, going no. into Germany or. No, we were too busy too with busy. our own little yeah. thing going on. Descri would you describe this picture? Well, that's uh, she and I getting married, and uh, it was at my aunt's house in uh, close to Rossville, Georgia, and uh, just out of Chattanooga. And uh, they was just her folks there, and my dad, and uh, my aunt and uncle who house was getting married in and a minister and I guess uh, two or three other people so it wasn't any big affair. It was to me. It was to you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's 25 people there. Yeah, but uh, then I hadn't seen my mother and she was in Detroit so we flew to Detroit and stayed a couple of days there and then come back to Chattanooga and it's time for me to head back to the West Coast and she did come out there okay. Uh, oh, after two or three weeks, and stayed with me till uh, I got to go to the East Coast, and then she came back home. In fact, a friend of mine was driving through, so we rode in a car okay. back to Chattanooga. And, and when did you exit the military? Pardon? When did you get out of the military? Uh, out of the Marines? May the twenty third, nineteen forty seven. Yeah, we never forget those days, do we? <laughs> I noticed you were uh, you were a gunnery sergeant. Yes. But, uh, I was very fortunate to, to I took uh, examination for PFC. They didn't make us PFC like they do now when you come in. And I waited nine months on the list to get PFC. Then I took a corporal's exam. So then uh, uh, passed that, and that's when I got my transfer that I asked for down to Dunedin, Florida. Well, if you took the maintenance course to look after them, you got another stripe. So that was what I was interested in. So I was a buck sergeant. And uh, then when we went to form their fourth tractor battalion with the 4th Marine Division, I don't think I told this, that they was having so much trouble with the tractors at that time, which is uh, in Ulithian, those islands there with the tractors, they formed the 10th Tractor Battalion out of our unit 
they split us in half, and there was the 10th and the 4th that went with the 4th Marine Division. Well, for some reason, the 10th was better liked than our <laughs> company commander was, so they split us out and we went down to Guadalcanal and joined up with the 1st Marine Brigade to go to Guam along with the 3rd Marine Division. And, uh, but it was uh, amazing how they would get all of these things coordinated and get them together. And uh, there was, as I say, they ended up with 11 tractor battalions. That's a lot of tractors over there. And uh, they'd, have, they'd, of course, had all been involved in uh, one going to... Well, how many tractors were in a company? Uh, we had about uh, 100. Okay. That is a lot of tractors. Yeah. It's, uh, it keep them going and all and keep the fuel for them and uh, did you find out when you first started when you first got over there did you have the equipment you needed to continue oh, yeah. to maintain them yeah. so you yeah. felt like you were prepared you had what you needed oh, the yeah. resources and, yeah. the, only, the only time I think uh, I think that uh, Okinawa they run out of ammunition there you know, it. Whoever doing the coordinating failed, to, yeah. so we really had to hustle to get ammunition in there because they're firing a lot of ammunition that many troops. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, the when you think back at it, the whole thing has to be well planned yeah. and well coordinated yeah. to to make it work. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, I want to give you a chance to just say anything you would like to say about, about your military service, your experiences, well, your life. Uh, I'm very proud to have been in the Marine Corps. I think it's the finest organization, the teachings they have. I don't know if you're aware of this. I don't think they do now. But all the officers had to go through with the regular recruits down there at the time before they sent them up to officer training school. They've got a little different situation now. Uh, but I keep up with what's going on, and uh, and as I say, I'm very proud to have been a Marine, and my family has helped me. Well, you should be proud, and we're proud of you. <laughs> and, and of Joyce. Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there any questions you have of us? Or, uh, Pardon? Do you have any questions for us? No, I can't think of anything. I think we've tried to cover it all. I can't think of anything. I, didn't cover that I should have, uh, but uh, it's uh, war is not a pleasant thing, and I often think about how different the United States is to other countries. If the Japan had won the war, they they wouldn't have given nothing back the way we did. We took all those islands and give them right back to them. Uh, the only one we kept was the one we had our own, uh, Guam. And, oh, that's a good point. So that's a very good point. That's uh, the United States is a very giving country, and uh, I often think about how we get involved, and none of the other countries come in and help the way we do. And uh, I hope it continues, but it don't look too good what's going on in Washington. Well, we just got to hope that the legacy you are responsible for will continue. Yeah. It it bothers me that. Uh, I don't see the patriotism among uh, sports figures, some that's in front of the people all the time. They're mm -hmm. looking around and they don't know how to yeah. uh, show patriotism. And yeah. Well, let, let me ask you a question. You, when, you were, when you and Joyce went back to visit in Guam, you were aboard the, the Bella Wood. Yes. And were there, were there Amtrakers on the ship? Uh, you know, I don't know at the time. I didn't get down to what was on there. Okay. Uh, but what, when the Marines on the ship, what were the kind of things they asked you about? Uh, well, not really. It was just kind of a celebration for us, you okay. know, being there. And uh, so it was unusual that they'd have beer aboard a ship, you know. And, but, but I mean, were they, did they have a lot of, the, the Marines that were there, did they have a lot of questions for you? No, not really. Uh, they, uh, they were just that part of the party. <laughs> you, 
Okay. No, I think he's covered it. I had a couple of things, but he finally got to it. So okay. I, I want to be sure Mr. Arnold has an opportunity to say anything <laughs> you'd like to say. But uh, well, on those ships, uh, the Marines have their own galley and their own cooks and everything. They're entirely separate, but they're right next to the Navy there. So, but they they are separate in that they they keep it that way, and I, I think that's better. Yeah. And uh, but. A lot of people don't know that there's a lot of those ships out there floating around. They don't let anybody know they're out there or where they're at or anything. Well, that's good. We don't, we don't want them to know, do we? <laughs> In fact, recently, this will be of interest to you, a friend of mine was doing some business with a paper. His son, and I wanted to meet him, had just got through at boot camp and uh, would come back home. Well, I had the day wrong, so I went there two days later, and he had already gone through. Well, I saw him recently and apologized. I said, I had some things I wanted to give you, son. Said, oh, he's happy as can be. Said, he's going aboard the Iwo Jima. Wow. And I said, I didn't get a chance to, yeah. he's in a hurry to tell him about it and what it was like and so on. I'm sure he didn't know that or yeah. his son didn't either. <laughs> but it was something that they had, I guess, probably 2,000 Marines that went to Pensacola when they had the christening of the evil team. Really? And it was, it was quite an experience. I bet it was. And uh, had them, of course, it's all lined up and the Marines up on the yeah. deck up there. And it, it was quite an experience. Well, I just want to thank you, not just for me, but from our country for what you did during the war and after the war. Thank but, you. I mean, there's people like you that the reason we're free now and we really appreciate your service and really appreciate you coming down here both of you to share your experiences and share your stories with us and uh, it's an honor to have had a chance to to hear your story and to meet you well it's uh, glad that i could be of service to my country and uh, as i say i've always been proud to be a marine and That'll carry me through my life. That's a good way to start. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was in the Marines, got out and went into the Army. Well, he was at one time, while he was in there, he stayed in the Army and retired. And, uh, but he got to be in uh, the uh, Arlington Guard. Oh, yeah. So that okay. made him eligible to be buried in there. Oh, gosh, yeah. Now here's the kicker. He told his wife that he retired, that he wanted to be buried in a Marine uniform. Really? That's wonderful. And she contacted me and wanted to know all about how to do it. Good. And he was buried in a Marine uniform. Good. So I thought that was yeah. pretty unique. Uh, yeah. uh, my company, first sergeant, went to uh, Washington and became a captain and I stayed in contact with him and he was buried in Arlington. Really? Well, I can pull up on the website and if anybody's buried in the National Cemetery, I can find where they are and the location and the whole thing. So uh, I did on him and we have been there uh, several times. Just, uh, we had the reunion in Washington, one, oh, did you? one of the reunions. Yeah. One was in Quantico. Well, They've been all over the country, oh, wherever that's right. Marine lives. That's, that's usually where we had it. That's good. That's wonderful. Guess that's about it. Well, okay. that's quite a story. Thank you very much again.